YouTube video starting, and we are live. Uh, hey, guys, we have Jeff Berlin. I don't know, as people are, are looking at their screen, they'll, they should see our little pictures on the bottom. Uh, Jeff, you're on my left. I guess wave and say hi. Hello. <laughs> hmm. Okay, good. And then Steve Sykes, uh, wave and say hi, although it's pretty obvious which one you are now. Yeah. I'm the one All right, with, so with not the big, huge, booming voice. Uh, I'm pretty far away from the mic, so if I'm booming now, then I have a problem. But You are booming now, but you should be booming. You're Jeff Berlin. I'm the non-voice uh, of God. My job is to boom. <laughs> All right. So we, okay, cool. This is going to be cool because uh, we've had Jeff. You're actually in – tell me where you're at again. You're not in your main studio. No, I had to drive out. Uh, I'm in my, my weekend home on Cape Cod in Wellfleet. Uh, see, I was going to say to the kids out there, uh, you become the voice of A and E, many a radio station, and the Opie and Anthony channel, amongst others, on Sirius XM. You get a Grand Theft Auto Five, Cape Cod, and what? And Grand Theft Auto Five. That's right. Oh, That's cool. actually, I forgot. Uh, do you, I might have already told you this? How cool I am to my girlfriend's boys that I know the the guy that's the voice of that, and that I know a couple of the guys that produce the radio stations on that game. That yeah. makes me cool. Well, Brian Apple in particular. Brian Apple, yeah. Uh, anyway, Steve Sykes now. You are in uh, the St. Louis area. Or you got a new house recently, is that correct? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in it right now. Yeah, it's a, it's a new old house. I'm on, the, uh, I'm on the third floor right now. This is my new studio. You can't really see much of it. I mean, you see the back there, but I actually, I actually have windows now. My old place, I was in the basement, and uh, it was really depressing, and... I said, never again. I, said, I need windows. So, yeah, I'm up on the so, third floor now. and Yeah, it's cool. It's great. Really you comfortable. such kindred spirits because my main studio is in an old house in the Yeah, third I remember floor. that. Yeah, I so remember that. I can relate. Yeah, it's, All right. a, it's, well, it's definitely a, a, a life-changing experience getting out of the depths of uh, darkness and into light. Yeah. All Here right. Well, that's that's great. So uh, anyway, um, just to kind of set this up on, on what I, I hope to achieve here, it's going to be totally laid back. You guys can, as Jeff's already shown, you can lift the camera up, flip around, show some crap. I know, Steve, yours is more of a uh, of, a, of a desktop. Yeah. Machine. Anyway, the point is, super loose. We can show what we want to show, but we want to talk tech, and we want to talk tech as it relates to the voice talent and as it relates to the freelance producer. So... We, while people who work in brick-and-mortar radio stations might pull a lot out of this, so that's great, we're kind of gearing it towards the individual and what they can do you know, on a budget or what they can do efficiently and how they can make their workflow better and the tools they can use both on the voiceover side and on the radio imaging production side. Now, Steve, you actually are way more than a radio imaging production guy, but you have a, a big background in that. And yeah. so you're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to utilize your brain on that side of it and then Jeff, again, you've got a strong radio imaging production, you know, audio file background. Well, we're going to utilize you more as the at-home professional voiceover guy. But since you both are so tech savvy, this is why I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of value here. So if you guys are good, I'm going to dive right in, and I'm going to start with the topic of microphones. This is something that comes up all the time because you have people that want to know you know, what is the best microphone, you have people that want to know what's the cheapest microphone that I can get by with, and then you have all, all the people that want to know everything in the middle. So the point is, let's start on the low end, and maybe Jeff will start with you. People say, what, what microphone for voiceover can I just get by with? You know, where, where's sort of the basement? What's your opinion on if there is a basement and where that basement is? Not from personal experience. I'd say the basement is the MXL mics from uh, Marshall. Uh, I've heard rave reviews about a lot of those, and the price point's like around $100. And I've seen torture tests where there was up against a you know, $2,000 U87, and the difference was indiscernible. Uh, but I haven't personally used the MXL mics, so I can't say from personal experience that that's the case. But if I had very little money and was trying to get started, that's where I'd start looking. Uh, Steve, let's go over to you now. Now, obviously... Uh your job, uh, you know, your income comes more from the production side of the business, but you have your hands deep into the world of voiceover with your wife, and then also you're just a talented guy, and you, you know. So, what are your thoughts on this? Um, 
I don't have any experience with, with the mics Jeff talked about um, either, but I, I've heard the same that he said. Um, you know, it's hard. People, people ask these questions, but um, there's no one-size-fits-all, you know, with these things. Um, but uh, there are definitely, the, the cool thing is, like, technology has advanced so much that even the budget gear is, is really good. Uh, it, it's good enough to, to, to broadcast, uh, you know, uh, in radio production, on television production. Um, I think the best thing you can do if you're looking for mic is go to a place like Guitar Center or something. And uh, some of these places, they, they, some of these locations have rooms that you could go in and try the mics out. Um, obviously, it's not the most ideal setting because there's going to be people around and stuff, but it'll give you an idea kind of how your voice is going to interact with, with that particular piece of gear so you're not going into it blindly because, you know, I'll see a lot of people, they'll buy things just because so-and-so said, you know, oh, this is a great mic, but then they get it in the studio and they're kind of like, eh. And, you know, some of these places you can't really, you know, send it back or, you, and if you can't send it back, it's a hassle. So you might as well just take the time, go somewhere and yeah. try a couple out, you know. I would agree with that, and uh, I I wanted to bring up, uh, on that end, there's different kinds of mics without really going too far into I mean, we could really probably do an entire show on microphones, and we don't want to do that, but uh, when we talk about maybe money isn't as much of an issue, somebody's been doing this a little while, and they want to put a good investment into it, uh, you've got your tube mics, you've got your condenser mics, your dynamic mics, uh, as far as you know, shotgun mics versus large diaphragm mics. Uh, the, the Sennheiser 416 is one that comes up in the top of or right at the top of the conversation all the time as far as shotgun mics. Then the Neumann TLM 103, um, that one comes up all the time as far as a diaphragm mic. Uh, yeah, Jeff, let's go back one. to you. If the TLM 103, yeah, yeah a lot that's of people. Yeah, that's a good one, yeah. It's not like cheap as far as price point goes, but it's not like going to kill you either as, you know, on the high end. It's a pretty yes. decent microphone. Let me throw my two cents into it, and then I'm going to let Jeff, you talk about it a little bit too from the voiceover standpoint. Um, I ended up, you know, when I, when I earned just enough income from voiceover, when I finally realized, okay, I'm, I'm okay at this and I'm making, you know, money, I decided to invest in the 416, largely because so many of the big-time talents had used it and also because it's an extremely forgiving mic. It has good low-end, good high-end, but if you're in a room that's not the best, kind of a, a loud room or, you know, uh, anyway, it's a very forgiving mic. So that's where I went. Tell me why I was right or wrong to do that or what are some other options people can do if they have some cash and they want to invest in a mic for voiceover. Well, the 416s come way down in price. I think I paid 1400 for my first one and now I think you can get them for 800 um, And you're right. They're, yeah. they're, they are forgiving, but in a sense they're not as well because you have to be right on them. The proximity is very specific. Uh, you can't be moving around too much when you're on a 416. So if you're a very animated voice person, that might not be the best one for you. You might want to get a large diaphragm mic that can, you know, give you a full cardioid pattern that you can perform in. Um, and I also, when I travel with a 416, and I use the 416 mostly in my whisper room, and I, I still worry a, a lot about the acoustic space. And uh, as forgiving as the mic is, if you can set it up so that the acoustics are good, it'll just be that much better. Uh, obviously, we want to, you know, provide as optimum a voice track as we possibly can in all in all situations. Um, so yeah, the, the 416 I, I think is an excellent mic. It, uh, it it picks everything up. It makes everything sounds good. It's smooth. Um, I can't say anything bad about it. So what is? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. What a fan do you, what of do you use? I, I'm... At home. I have a 416. Yeah. What, what do you? Use? Go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I have a 416 in my main studio in in Melrose. Uh, here on the Cape, I have a Sound Deluxe U99 that I'm using today. Uh, that's a tube, large diaphragm microphone that I bought maybe 10 years ago that I love. And uh, last week I was using it, and all of my clients were saying, wow, we like this a lot more. So I don't know what to do. I remember that mic, Jeff, when I was producing you back in the day. You, you used that one, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it, sounded, it always sounded great. So, yeah, it just it cuts you through, you know. And now, now if you wanted to get a mic like that, I think you'd have to purchase a Bach, because whoever the guy was that was doing Sound Deluxe before is now Bach. Uh, the good thing about the 416 is it's um, it, it's really focused, um, and although sonically it's not my you know favorite sound, it's a it's it's a very EQable uh, microphone. 
So you can uh, kind of make about that real you're quick. Kind of sculpt it into what you want, you know. You said sonically, it's not your favorite sound. Why is that? And and you know, explain that. And what would be what would be an example of sonically your favorite sound or something? Um, that well, I don't, I don't know if I really have a favorite, but um, I don't know. I, I, I guess um, it doesn't have that um, kind of over the top, larger than life kind of thing going on. Um, it's just very kind of neutral, I guess. I don't know if neutral is exactly the best word to use, but it's just not very big sounding. Um, but no, I mean, I think it's really for, for its purpose. I mean, I, the 416, if I'm correct, if I'm not mistaken, that's like a, wasn't it like a Foley mic or something? Or, or maybe yeah, ADR? Yeah, it sound it, yeah. it was like in film, like on... Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, it, it was never intended for voiceover. Yeah, yeah. It's So it's really good at, like, uh, just kind of just kind of capturing the sound in a sort of uh, neutral-ish type way. Um, but I don't know if I really have a favorite sound, to be honest. Uh, I tend to favor more of the the smoother kind of, you know, vintage sounding type microphones, but that's largely because mostly what I record these days is, you know, music stuff. But uh, for VO, I always like those mics where you kind of you talk into it, and then it's just like, boom, there it is, you know, and you don't have to do a lot of fut futzing around with it. Right. Um, Cool. Um, I think no, that that's great stuff, especially the low end stuff. People are always asking, you know, the, the starters are always asking, look, I, I want to do it and I want to do it right, but I ain't got two grand. So you know, the MXL that you guys mentioned, uh, or Jeff, you know, that that's a good place for people to start. And the fact that the 416 is coming down, and Jeff, it looks like you wanted to say one more thing about this. Yeah, well, I just have a story about the 416 versus because Steve, you said it was very EQable. Is um. You know, I have the two studios, and they have a different sound, but I, I voiced a promo for a TV station here with the U99, and then they had a pickup uh, that I had to do in Melrose on the 416, and I, I was very carefully comparing the two tracks, and I used Nectar, and I found a setting, and I got the 416 to sound exactly like my U99 here, and there was no discernible difference, listening very, very carefully, and they didn't know that I was in a different studio in a different room. So mm -hmm. it's like, you're very right. It's, it's very easy to shape microphone. People say that about the U87, too. Uh, I, I think which is why a lot of um, voiceover studios will have a U87 in-house because that's another one I think that you can sort of sculpt and make it sound however you need it. Um, so they're sort of similar in that sense, although vastly different in, in terms of, you know, largeness and things like that. But I think both of those microphones are very sculptable. Let me get you they don't guys... sound like incredible, like right out the gate, you know, but you can make them sound pretty decent with, uh, with some EQ. Let's move this... Uh... To, to the next topic, uh, outboard gear. We have people ask about that, and especially these days with a home studio. You know, what do you need to have? What, what, what do you maybe you want to have, but you don't actually need? Because these days, with everything being done so much more in the box, you know, there there are more and more plugins that can do anything you need inside the DAW. Um, first of all, I want your both opinions on preamps because a lot of people will still invest in a very good preamp, especially when it comes for voiceover. But otherwise, is there any outboard gear that one needs to have? Steve, let's start with you on this one. I think you, I, I, mic pre is, I think, the most important. You need, you need a way to get the sound into your DAW, uh, you know, in a clean manner. Um, I think that's the number one thing is you want to get a really, the best you can afford mic preamp. For voiceover, you know, I used to really be into the, the tube stuff. The problem with that, with voiceover, though, is if, you know, you got to turn that stuff on. It's got to heat up. And if you've got, like, let's say you left your gear off and then you got a client calling and say, hey, I need this right now. You know, you got to wait for it to, to warm up, you know, to get that optimal sound. So I actually think if you're doing VO, I think it's better to just stick with, you know, the, the, the solid state kind of uh, non-tube stuff. Just something that you can turn on and it's ready to roll. Um, tube is cool, but um, I, I, nowadays I like that more for musical applications, like recording acoustic guitar and things like that, or warming up like a synthesizer, running, you know, thing, things that we could get crunchy sounding and stuff. But for VO, um, I, I would I would stick with a non-tube preamp if you're looking for just convenience and 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 they are going to be a little more clean too, um, the non-tube stuff. And so. Jeff, you can continue on this. Now, does someone actually need a preamp? I mean, what I mean to say is if you have an audio interface, 
that apply that that gives you clean phantom power that has a preamp built in or no do you need to have a preamp or can you just stick your mic directly into the audio interface and start recording in your in your DAW whether it be Pro Tools or Audition or um, uh, or a free Reaper or a free alternative maybe Jeff you talk about that it depends on the uh, interface. I, here I have Metric Halo ULN2, and the mic pre's in that are so good, they rival the Great River mic pre that I'm using here, that I would use that. Uh, my old Mbox had the worst, most crappy preamps I've ever heard, and like a, a, a Mackie board has bad preamps, so it really varies. If the preamp is good in your interface, then sure, go ahead and use it. Uh, you're using it for convenience. Uh, I, I agree with Steve, you want to get like the best preamp you can get, but it's also like buying a car. It's like, what's better, the Volvo or the Saab, you know, like, you can get a Grace, a Millennia, uh, John Hardy. They all make excellent preamps. I've never used any of them. I would love to someday. But I really like the preamps I have now, which are an Avalon M5. And here I have a Great River INV ME. And as a backup, I'll use my ULN2, which will stand up to either one of those. Yeah, it goes It goes back to the, the, you know, the evolution of technology. Like the preamps in these interfaces are getting better and better with every um, new piece of gear that comes out. Um, so I think a lot of times you can get away with just plugging it right into your interface and, and, and rolling with that. So I have, um, a Focusrite, I have a Focusrite Sapphire Pro 24 Firewire interface here, for example. And I have this, I was actually going to bring this up in the mic talk, but it went too long. I have a, uh, hey, we, we have Jeff on. <laughs> We've got two Jeff Berlins. Two Jeffs. <laughs> That's weird. Uh, <laughs> hey, can you hear me? Because it told me my mic went out. Um, yeah, we can hear you. We see you twice, actually. Anyway, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll Look just at move that on picture. And assume we'll be. Yeah, you see yourself. <laughs> I'll just move on and assume we're still okay. Um, no, no, actually. I love how the frozen so Jeff, Jeff, Jeff is kind of like scowling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Frozen Jeff isn't happy right now. Uh, I have a Focusrite Sapphire, and I'm told the Focusrite preamps are actually very good. So I run my mic directly into that, and anything I apply to my voice ever after that is in Pro Tools using plugins, audio plugins, software. So what would be wrong with that? Because you know the, I got the Sapphire Pro for I think like 250 bucks or something. That's a pretty cheap option. What, what's wrong with what I just set up there? I'll answer. Uh, the yeah. only thing I can think of that might be wrong with that is it makes it harder for you to monitor yourself. Uh, if you want to hear immediate feedback in your headphones, when you go into the box, you're immediately introducing latency. Uh, so you're probably going to hear yourself on the mic, but you might have a hard time hearing what you're doing further down the road. If you're using outboard gear, it's instant. There's no latency. So you can hear the compression, you can hear the gate, you can hear the EQ in your headphones while you're reading. And personally, I like that. Um, that that's the biggest drawback. Other than that, sonically, the end result is very likely to be the same. Well, and there's also something to be said for convenience. If you've got a really cool sounding outboard chain set up, you could record and go. You don't have to bounce or futz with plugins and things because your audio is being printed, ready to roll. Um, so if you spend the time to, you know, get a nice chain put together and tweak it and make it sound really awesome, you know, that that's going to speed things up for you. Obviously, the drawback is it's going to print with that. Without whatever settings you have, and if you decide, yeah, I don't really like that, or it's not working for this particular application, you can't take it off. Um, which you know, there's the benefit of plugins, but I guess you got to kind of weigh, you know, weigh your, uh, the pros and cons to, to to both methods. I have two things, Jeff. Let me ask you this first. When I record voiceover, again, I'm no Jeff Berlin. I know a lot of people, but you know, I'm I'm pretty good these days. Anyway, I do not have headphones on. I don't do it with headphones. I don't like to record with headphones. I feel like it makes me start getting radio-y. It just makes me start overdoing it. Anyway, why is that a stupid thing I just said? Or do you agree? Is it better not to use headphones when you record voice? Uh, it's case by case. Uh, I, I take the headphones off when I want to sound like Joe Normal. Uh, if I'm trying to project some kind of an attitude, the headphones help me. Um, it arguably can be a crutch to wear headphones, apply processing in the headphones and get that feedback, but some of the reads I'm doing are really uh, understated reads and it, it helps bring that out in me and I find that my reads will be better when I'm wearing the headphones than when I'm not, depending on the kind of read. Uh, there's nothing wrong with not wearing headphones. A lot of purists will say that you should never wear headphones, actors is, is especially. You know, someone acting on a stage obviously isn't wearing headphones. Sure, sure. 
Um, and Steve, maybe you could talk about this too because you just sort of brought it up. Tell me why this is a bad or a good thing. I know a lot of people do this. Um, voice talents, uh, producers especially that become voice talents are starting to utilize this. But anyway, uh, bypassing outboard gear, but you still want to apply color to your voice going into. So, you know, you, you turn on plugins and you sort of reverse the aux chain and you, you print whatever you want from your EQ or your little compressor or your gate yeah. on an internal software plugin as you go into the editor. Therefore, as you said, you don't have to deal with bouncing and you can just apply those on the fly. Why is that a good or a bad technique? I mean, it's, it's, it's a personal preference thing, really. I mean, it, and it's also, uh, I think, uh, dependent on application, you know. Um, if you want the freedom to be able to tweak per client, um, probably the best bet would be to just record your voice in completely dry and clean with nothing going on, and then you create different tracks. And I know, Jeff, you, you kind of do this, don't you, where you have different Constant. settings? I mean, if you want, I can bring the... I'm not in my studio right now, but I can show you my setup, but I have a whole bunch of auxiliary tracks, each feeding yeah. a different setting to a different track. So in one pass, I hit record. When I'm done, I, I hit stop. I've instantly created five audio files, each one with its own processing setting, uh, including one that's completely clean, so that you, the producer, have your choice. And, and, and you can just export it, right? You don't have to go through the whole real-time balance. You could just and send it No, off. I, just, I just instantiate the record track. I just, you know, record enable it. Sorry, instantiates for plugins, I guess. Um, I just record enable whatever I want to record, whatever setting I want to record. It's all static. Um, but, yeah, I mean... With, with so what I'm saying is when you, you come in, through, when you come in printing through those plugins, when you're done, you could just export that audio and send it off to your client, right? Without having yeah. to wait for it to bounce and exactly, I just you know, I highlight it, I rename it, and then export it right away. Yeah. It's already recorded. There you go. Much faster. Uh, I think that's, that's a great tip, uh, Jeff. You brought that up uh, when I interviewed you. Were I think you were my second podcast actually, so uh, we go way back now. But you brought that up back then, and, and so I started doing that. So I'll record a couple different filters when I record uh, voiceover, and a lot of stations love that. It's a great tip, and as you say, print print whatever you're going to do on the fly, and then uh, you, you're exporting and you're not bouncing at the end. I think it's a good it's, tip. It's really just to save time, because otherwise, if you're going to apply audio suite processing to the track, you're spending a lot of time with each track. And if you're just doing one session a day, maybe that's fine. Some of us are busy. <laughs> uh, room treatment. Let's go to the room. A lot of people like to ask about this, and there's different opinions on what you can, what you can't do, what you should, what you shouldn't do on a budget. Money's no issue. Jeff, you mentioned a whisper room. Anyway, let's start with you because when, when we were actually talking about this uh, tech roundtable in email, you brought up, Jeff, that you have a lot of opinions on the room, and you, and your opinions have changed over the years. You're a very successful voice talent who records in multiple places, so I put a lot of value into what you have to say about this. So start with maybe what is the bare minimum someone could, can or should do, and then what, forget about money, what should we be doing to our room? Where should you be recording your voice in? Um, well, I said in the email, I like to record in an anechoic chamber with absolutely no room reflections, completely dead. Uh, the reason for that is because you can always add ambience afterwards with reverbs, um, but you can't take it out once it's in, although there's that new D-Reverb plugin from uh, Isotope RX3, so maybe that is a new possibility. Uh, but, you, but basically, you, you're introducing phase cancellations. The slightest room reflection, like a, a glass surface just inches away from the mic, means that your voice is going to hit the mic, and then it's going to hit it again, like maybe a half a millisecond later. Maybe that's not going to be much of an effect, but 10 milliseconds will create a huge effect, and you could dull the high end and just make your voice sound much more flat, and, and much, you know, much more. You just basically want your voice to hit the mic and nothing else. So that's my opinion. Uh, I know a lot of, you know, if you're recording drums or other musical instruments, this is not necessarily the case. But for voice, uh, I've always tried to keep it as dead as possible. Uh, so what I've done over the years is just add more and more and more sound absorption. My favorite weapon is the Oralex Leonard Bass Trap, which is a giant, you know, three square cubic foot cube of foam, and it just absorbs all the mid range. It's supposed to absorb bass. They call it a bass trap. It really doesn't. It absorbs the mid range, but that's most, you know, most uh, most of the frequencies in our voice are that are mid range. Um, if you want, I'll walk over and I can show you what I got. But I use. Uh, I also have a lot of uh, what I'm seeing in Steve's yeah, room. Yeah, please so do. Real traps. Yeah, I'll walk over. I just don't know about the Wi-Fi. If, uh, if, you, if I start to drop out, I'll come back. Um, okay. The Wi-Fi is in the living room here. I, this is my pirate radio station operation here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, 
but I'm heading out. Um, but yeah, that real traps, uh, Orlex Max Walls. Where are we going? Yeah, Berlin Cribs tour here. Oh, uh, this is uh, my deck. <laughs> I don't know what you can see. It was, uh, in the garage next door. All right, let's see if we make it. Jeff, where, where's your studio? Is it like an outhouse or something? Where are you going? <laughs> I think we might have lost him. <laughs> I, I, think I, lost, I lost you, Ryan. I can't see your video anymore. Oh, there you are. Oh, okay, good. Is he back? Jeff, you back? Is that is that live, Jeff, or is that a ghost image from ten minutes ago? <laughs> Jeff? <laughs> Jeff? No, I don't I don't think Can you hear that. me? Oh, I hear oh well, you. kind of. Where where is his studio? Where did, I heard I hear you guys. I don't know if you can hear me. Where are you? Are you in, are you back inside or I'm over to my studio yeah, I think. Uh, on, that I have out on Cape Cod. Hmm. All right. Well, show us around real quick. We're we're absolutely losing you. So show us around real quick, and then run back in. Hurry up. <laughs> All right. I don't think I think this is working out too well. Yeah, this isn't. Hey, Jeff. I don't know if you can hear us, but why don't you come back in the chamber? This isn't working out uh, too well. Steve, I'm gonna just go back to you here and see if Jeff can hear us that we can't hear him. And why don't you talk about room treatment? You just recently set up a studio where you're focusing more on production. Mm -hmm. You also yeah, set I mean, up... I'll let, I'll let Jeff focus on the on the, the VO side of it. As far as the Good. production standpoint goes, um, I like things a little bit, you know, livelier. Um, you know, my room is... Um, I've got... You can't really see... I can't... I'm sorry, I can't move my screen around, but, you know, you can see behind me That's over okay. here... There's some panels. I've got these all over the room. Those are GIK acoustic um, panels. Um, I've got bass traps, and I've got uh, just the, the standard, you know, um, absorb, you know, high-end stuff absorb absorption going on as well. And um, I don't, I didn't, I had more up before, but I didn't like how I like a little lively, liveliness, at, at least for like producing music and things like that. So I don't have this room completely dead. And I actually record vocals in here too. We have a vocal booth downstairs made by vocalbooth.com that we could use, you know, for if you know Mel uses it, but I could use it if I wanted a completely dead sound. But I just do it in here because I like the organic kind of live kind of feel to things. And just to um, let people know what you're doing, you actually um, produce uh, music for picture. You produce sound design. You produce a lot of different things, but you also have a jingle product where you're singing. So you record yeah. uh, vocalists actually in the room you're in right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, um, yeah, I do music for media, music and sound design for media. So you know, I'll record vocals for jingles, but I also record for other things too. Um, and I'll set up like a gobo back here with a bunch of panels, kind of on stands, and I'll create, I'll sort of surround the the vocalist with them, and it it gives me enough of that um, of of a dead sound to be able to work with it, and you know. If I, I, I can, I've recorded it open too, and it's it's fine. Um, you know, I, 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 like I said, I like that type of sound. But so uh, on a vocal specifically, and maybe you could talk about voiceover, but just generally, you know, Jeff and and others sternly believe you want a dead room. I mean, you want the room to add nothing to the vocal. And you're are you sort of disagreeing? Are you saying no, you actually? No, I mean, you know that. No, I I I, I see the benefit of that um, as far as producing. Uh, you know. Radio imaging and um, I mean anything with spoken word. Yeah, absolutely. I can see the benefit to that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, All right, I was just trying to start a fight, but that's yeah, no, I, no, no. I think I think if I was recording VO, I would I would record it downstairs. I wouldn't do it up here. I let, think me, let me let me let me bring this up because it's come up uh, in a couple other episodes, and then I had somebody who's a very skilled sound engineer in Dallas uh, chime in about it. People will say that a very low-cost, easy way to get a vocal booth going for someone who's just starting out is to actually quite literally go into the closet and record in there. Do you have an opinion? Jeff, we'll start with you. Do you have an opinion on whether your closet is actually a good space to record voiceover? No, I've, I've tried recording in closets whenever I travel. You guys can hear me okay now, right? Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> Sorry about all that. Um, when I travel, I've gone to hotel rooms, and I've tried to set up 
a variety of you know acoustic situations using all the upholstery in the hotel, and I've had very little success. Um, what I found is you need some space around you, uh, some dis like no, you don't want clothing like right on top of you because you're going to sound muffled, I guess. Uh, so the closet's fine as far as uh, deadening the potential room reflections or you know or blocking any sound from outside from getting in, but you still need to create to carve out some kind of a space where you can work, where you can move your arms around. Uh, and the microphone is in that. And that's the only way to get uh, a closet or crawling under blankets in a hotel uh, to sound decent. Uh, it's possible to do. My, I, I've started using a, a tent, a little kid's tent that I said that I carry with me now when I travel. I posted I pictures of luck doing the closet thing. It, it'll sound boxy or sometimes it sounds muffly or there's, you know, maybe a kind of a weird sort of reflection of some type. I've just never had good luck doing the... Uh, in the closet thing, so I, I avoid it. I've had a couple people say that that they they use it as an easy space. Um, and others say it's a terrible idea, but um, I think if it's a big opinions. closet. I think if it's a big closet, you could you know you can maybe make it work. But most most yeah. homes don't have you know, you know these guys don't have these big walk-in closets. It's you know probably a standard bedroom closet of some type, and you know you've got like the drywall and the, it just I, I haven't had good luck with it. If I mean. The thing I always do is uh, you clap your hands. Um, yeah. and that, when you do that, you immediately hear your room reflections. There's a ton of them in this room. Uh, in a closet, you sound like you're in a closet, and you're going to sound like you're on a closet on the microphone too. And if you step out of the closet and you go in your room, there's a lot of room reflections. That also will be a, an unusable voice track. So you, you need to spend a lot of time uh, carving out a proper space if you, if you want to use it you know, on a regular basis. Let's uh, move over to some software solutions now. Um, we kind of talked about hardware, mics, outboard gear, preamps, and all that. Um, obviously, if, if someone's going to work in this field, whether it's on the production side or the voiceover side, they need a piece of software to record into or mix with. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you this time. What are your opinions on what people need, should, could, have, are there any rules? Yeah. You know, what no. are your thoughts on that before no getting rules. started? I mean, it, it's all what you're comfortable with. All of this software uh, basically does the same thing. You know, it's a way to get your sound either in the computer, it's a way to edit the sound and process it, whatever. Um, it, it really comes down to where do you feel most comfortable. I've used everything. Um, you know, I, when I really started getting heavy into music production, um, I moved to Ableton Live. I was doing the Ableton Live and Pro Tools thing for a while. And I dropped Ableton Live because I was kind of like, just didn't feel right anymore. And I just said, I'm just going to keep everything in Pro Tools. Did the Pro Tools thing. And then Pro Tools didn't feel right anymore. And I switched to Logic. And now I use Logic. And Logic, for me, I feel like I found, I found what, uh, what fits me best. You know, it was a kind of a natural fit when I moved to Logic. But I could go back to Pro Tools. I could go back to Ableton Live. I could do the same exact thing. And I could churn out the same exact result. Because I think once you know the basics of how all these things work, you could really use any type. It's it's just a matter of you know getting familiar with navigating the menus and that sort of thing. But as far as you know mixing and producing and all that stuff, once you know the basics, you could pretty much use any software. And then it just comes down to a personal preference, which one you feel uh, most comfortable in, wh which one helps you work quicker, things like that. So I think it's just experiment, try try a couple different things, and just see which one. Uh, you know, matches your particular style or workflow best, and and run with it. You know, like I said, once I discovered Logic, and I, you know, my main bread and butter is I'm a composer. I, I write music for a living, and I need to do it quickly. And Logic for me, I'm the quickest in Logic when it comes to putting together a track. I'm about twice as fast in Logic than I am in Pro Tools. So that's why. All I right, let me that. let me expand. On, Just made sense. Let me expand on that real quick. And Jeff, I'll go to you after this. Um, for somebody that is sort of young at this, maybe you know you got a lot of radio people too that are you know I'm a program director, I'm the morning guy, I um, I clean the bathrooms, and now I got to be the production guy at the station. Um, do you have Steve? Do you have a uh, I don't know a thought on what might be the easiest place to start? Like which which DAW, which audio editor Pro is tools. maybe the easiest one to start out in? I'd say Pro Tools. I'd say Pro Tools. Really. Yeah. You say that Pro Tools would be easier to get going than Audition or than uh, Reaper or any uh, Logic, any other one. I think so. Um, when I look back on you know 
the years and all the different things. And I, and I, only, I only brushed it uh, on, on a couple of the DAWs I've used. I mean, I've used them all. When I look yeah. back on it, I remember Pro Tools. I remember very distinctly how excited I was that I was producing promos in it the same day I got it. I just remember it felt it just was easy because everything was right there. It was laid out really well. Um, editing audio was really quick. And I think, you know, personally, I, I, I think Pro Tools is the best way to go if you're going to be chopping up audio and, and putting promos together and, and things like that. I, I don't like it so much for MIDI-based stuff, but I think for radio imaging, uh, I think Pro Tools is, is really a winner. I'm actually surprised that you said that. I, I thought maybe you would – I just didn't think you would say that. I absolutely agree. And that's a guy coming from a guy who used Cool Edit for years. Cool Edit yeah. is extremely simple and basic. And then yeah, uh, and I started my broadcast career using Cool Edit, and you would think that that was where you know that's. I really think Pro Tools felt easier and more natural um, to use. Now I'm not like you though, because I actually try and go over to other DAWs from time to time. Like I broke out, I bought Reaper a while back and tried to use that, and then. Um, the new audition, I have that, and I've yeah. tried to use other things, but getting into them is more difficult for me than it was when I first got into Pro Tools. So I agree yeah. with you completely. Yeah. Uh, but the price tag's a little tough, right? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a difference. Um, I think the best bang for your buck, as far as what I use, I think is Logic. If you're, excuse me, if you're looking for something that has like just everything ready to go, like let's say you have no money to buy plugins, you just have enough money to buy a DAW, and that's it. If you buy Logic, you're going to spend uh, $1.99, I think, on the App Store, and you're going to get everything you need to create, whether uh, radio imaging or to create a soundtrack. It's right there. And that, that is one of the things that impressed me the most is the built-in sounds that came in Logic are phenomenal. I mean, the EQs, the compressors, the everything, it's just top-notch. It's like third-party quality, um, you know, like the way... You've got a great ear, so... Do do they really rival Waves? I mean, literally? Oh, yeah. if it, you know, honestly, I don't really use Waves anymore. I, I There's very few plugins from Waves that are in my regular workflow. You know, obviously, the L1, that's a classic. It's very useful. It's like a utility plugin for me. You know, I do use the Waves L1 for things. I, I don't abuse it, but, I you know, I, I, I like to have that um, ready to go when, when necessary. But I, I can't really think of anything else from Waves that I use anymore. I feel like... Um, the Slate stuff has really kind of taken over as far as the, 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 the major player in, in the plug-in world. But anyway, back to the logic thing. Yeah, the built-in effects, yes, they absolutely rival anything else out there that you can buy. So as far as best bang for your buck goes, I think logic. But I will say this. I know guys from the audio world, like my friend Nick Daly, you know, he's a big uh, audio pr production type guy, meaning, you know, chopping up audio and building things. And he's not much of a MIDI guy, but he's like, he does post-production and all that stuff. He did not like using Logic. He, it, it didn't work for him. He, he thought that editing audio and it didn't really feel, you know, organic and it wasn't quick enough and things. So, you know, some audio guys, specific guys, may share his sentiment. Like I said, I'm more of a MIDI-based dude. You know, I'm, I'm composing, you know, synths, using synths and things like that. So Logic felt right for me as far as that goes, but... Nice. All right, so Jeff, let's go over to you now. Now, you, I know you have a big background in uh, production, and you're still, you know, fluent. Um, but we can we can talk on the voiceover side, maybe for voiceover talent. What are your opinions on uh, software that one should get into as a voice talent first, and then we can talk a little bit more about it. If you're just getting started and you've never used <clears throat> any software to record before, Probably Twisted Wave is the is the most logical choice just for voice work because it, it's just a two channel recorder and it's very That's simple. That's just for Mac, right? I guess so. Yeah, I only use Macs now, so uh, uh, I, you know if you're I guess you know you'd want to use Audition maybe uh, if you were doing a PC. But having said that, I, I'm I'm also a Pro Tools guy and uh, I want to try Logic now after hearing what Steve just said about all the plugins. Jeez, uh, I yeah, you know, tried too. a lot more. I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. That's all. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I do think digital audio workstations are like religions or like languages. It's exactly what Steve said. It's your preference. It's what you're comfortable with. It's what you're most personally productive with is what you should use because ultimately the end result will be the same. I've heard brilliant production done by John Frost and Kelly, Kelly, Kelly on, you know, what's Kelly using? Saw. Saw. Pro. Yeah. I, I really old software, and John was doing everything on um, the old uh, Orban DSC with the the yeah. Audacity. With the job wheel, that yeah. the workstation. Like, 
ancient, archaic, but yeah. the end result was brilliant and still holds up. So yeah. you know what you use, it's it's not what you use, it's it's how it sounds in the end that matters. Um, but, but having said that, as, I, I, as far as getting started out, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you, you mentioned Twisted Wave. That is an inexpensive math program that's very simple to use. Have you guys used Audacity? That's the free program. Um, do, you, do you think, Jeff, is, is that a good place that people could start, or is that not good enough? My problem with Audacity is they had their own proprietary file format or something. They, they were not opening and closing standard Wave, AFF, or MP3 files. And in order to save it as an MP3, you had to download the lame library, and it was it was a convoluted setup to actually get it to export something that your clients could use. That was my only issue with Audacity. It was free, but it, it wasn't easy to to use like Twisted Wave, which would be which would just immediately record native. I mean, if you're not doing AFF Wave or MP3, then you're creating problems for your clients trying to use your files. Jeff, let's stay with you on this. I, I wanted to bring in a question somebody had submitted. I have absolutely no knowledge on this. Where is it? Um, we're talking about Waves plugins versus Universal Audio plugins. Uh, Jeff, do you have any uh, experience with Universal Audio versus Waves? I know you've used Waves, and you do use Waves. All my Universal Audio gear is upward. Um, Universal Audio, that's the way it's built, though, right? Or are they, are they recently just changed over where they're actually uh, using non-hardware solutions? No, they have the, the UAD. Uh, it's... Um... It's, it's like a card or a... Like a, a DSP. Little... Yeah, it's a DSP. Right. Yeah, and, and I've heard raves about it. I would love to get my hands on one, but I don't yeah. really need one right now. Uh, but I, very, I have a very high regard for the company. They're, everything I've heard from them right. has been stellar. So, Steve, maybe uh, you can... Yeah, talk I, don't, I don't have any of their software, but I have Outboard uh, by Universal Audio, but I, d I hear nothing but amazing things about, about yeah. their plugins. I hear they're some of the best out there in terms of kind of capturing that... You know, analog what the, sound. What are the Slate plugins you were talking about? I'm not even familiar with that company. Yeah, man, I'm I, I'm just blown away by everything that Slate puts out right now. Um, I uh, I use his uh, virtual tape machine um, religiously. I mean, it's in every single one of my sessions. Wow. And not necessarily because I'm trying to create like a, you know a vintagey tape sound, but there's just cool things you can do with it that like smooth. It, it just glues things together. It smooths things out. Um, I mean, I use it for everything from putting it on my master bus to just kind of get stuff to stick together a little better to um, just the other day I recorded some electric guitar and I used Guitar Rig and I found I, I kind of created this patch. I was like, man, this sounds really cool, but it was a little too harsh. Yeah. But I just couldn't get it to sound smoother, but I didn't want to change it. You know, I didn't want to get rid of the preset. So I said, how can I smooth this out? And I tried everything. I threw the Slate virtual tape machine on top of it, fussed around with it for a couple of seconds, and I was like, there's my sound. There it is. It's like he just makes plugins that are. I mean, I use the drum. He he makes the drum, the Seamus Lake drums. I use those for a lot of my, uh, you know, rock or acoustic type drum sounds, and I, just everything he does, I think, is incredible. It's just like next level. Um, wow. I'll have to check that know, out. I mean, the wave stuff is good. It's still great. I mean, you know, I just again, I think it's a personal preference thing. You know. Let me I've been trying to get away from waves. Let me bring up two things. Uh, actually, to jump in on on the software side here. Uh, guitar rig. You just mentioned it a little bit there. You guys actually went back and forth in our email chain yeah. about how you both love it. Uh, let's, Steve. Let's start with you. Why is guitar rig so awesome? And how does a guy like me producing radio imaging utilize? I that use tool? guitar rig for uh, multiple purposes. I'll use it for the standard. Okay, let me add some distortion to this guitar or synth. I use it at, I'll put it on an aux track and I'll send vocals to it to grunge up some, some, some either VO or a sung vocal. I also use it as a sound design tool because Guitar Rig is a, it's, it's a virtual rack and you could pull in all these little components into it, right? And, and the stuff it comes with is really cool. There's a lot of cool, I think a lot of people um, don't realize how many cool little effects there are in there, these little things that you can modulate the sound and just really neat little things that, are, that work well in the sound design application. There's um, this thing called Tractors 12, I think, uh, that Native Instruments makes that loads into Guitar Rig. Dude, it's awesome. It's it's like DJ tools, but you can use it to... Um, it works really well for adding movement to synths or uh, glitching out vocals or just doing kind of trippy stuff. You can take a piece of sound design, maybe you have this kind of raw sound, right? and maybe pull in, there's one thing I like to use on it called Gator, and it, it's basically a gate effect, a rhythmic gate, 
So like, let's say you have this raw sound, maybe it's like a kind of thing, right? You pull it in, run it through that gator, and it'll go You know what I mean? You could do kind of cool stuff like that. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Weird kind of uh, formant filters where you could kind of do like that kind of robotic-y kind of thing. I uh, just all kinds of stuff. Like, I think the native instrument stuff is, in terms of best bang for your buck for third-party plugins, if you buy like complete, bam, you're set. Yeah. yeah. Really I kept hearing stuff. that, and I bought Complete 8, and uh, I, I was so excited. But it's so overwhelming. You get so a lot of stuff, yeah. right out of the gate. Anyway, then yeah. Complete 9 came out, and you're the reason I ended up paying for that update because of a couple of the tools that came with that. Um, let's yeah, actually, get... you know, it's funny. I'm, ta I'm, I'm saying how Slate's kind of taken over, but I, actually, I use a lot of that new native instrument stuff. Uh, I use their EQs. I use the vintage compressors, which I absolutely love. Um, I use um, the Solid Mix series that they put out. Uh, they've got a reverb called Reflector. That's really cool. It's a convolution reverb. Uh, man, actually, in hindsight, yeah, I, I would say probably the Native Instruments, all these new bundles from Native Instruments are probably at the top of my list, right up there with the Slate stuff. As far as using the Lego. And that's and cool for guys. That's cool for guys producing radio imaging as well because, um, you know, I, I want to try and keep this focused on those guys and not music composers. Yeah. Um, but, but there's a lot of cool things you can do to already produced music beds and vocals well, yeah. I mean, and look, entire mix using the tools. Yeah, production is production. It doesn't matter if you're making a, a promo or a music bed. It, it, you use all the same kind of techniques and, you know, uh, and tricks in, in both. Um, so yeah, any anything I say absolutely applies to putting together a promo or you know when I do imaging I like to because I'm a music guy I like to approach it with with some type of musicality. So like these tools are really great because like let's say I'm doing a promo or or like you know the, the Bobby Bone stuff. A lot of that stuff has this sort of musical element to it, and these tools like from Native Instruments and stuff really uh, were integral in that sound. You know because they kind of you know, like like I said, the Tractor's 12 effect in Guitar Rig Pro, it, it helped me add movement to some of those effects and stuff that I did on his pieces, you know, the glitchy stuff or the, you know, things like that. So a any of these application, any of these tools can be applied to either, to, to both seamlessly. Um, uh, and so Jeff, if, if, let's if, go if back over to you here. looking for something uh, to get them going um, quickly and, and just sounding awesome, uh, the complete stuff is, is really a good place to start. Jeff, let's go back over to you now as far as uh, software tools. Uh, maybe you can tell us some little, I don't know, some, some secret thing you have, but what you're applying to your voiceover, if anything, internally, anything that jumps out at you as something people should look into? Isotope. Uh, Isotope Ozone 5 and Nectar are indispensable for voiceovers. They can take a really crappy sounding voice track and, make, and sweeten it uh, so that it'll just pop in almost any situation. Um, that's probably, in my opinion, a really powerful bang for your buck. It costs, I don't know, 150, 200 bucks to get Nectar, and it's a complete suite. It, it'll give you saturation, de-essing, uh, gating, uh, several stages of compression. You can sequence it any way you like. It's absolutely, uh, it's very flexible and very powerful. Uh, although I, I share uh, Steve's enthusiasm for Complete 9. I have that too, and I use that uh, with great glee. It's really great. You know, speaking of isotope, I use, um, this, is, this is on my must-have list. Isotope Trash 2. I just got that, actually, from it's awesome. and many it's recommendations. It's a great tool for radio producers because you can use it um, to really, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, I hear a lot of guys going, how do you make sound design? How do you, you know, and I think that's a really cool tool to add to the sound design arsenal. If you're looking to build up a, a collection of tools that you can use to create your own sound design, uh, Trash 2 is, is one of them um, because it does more than distortion. It does a lot of cool, crazy stuff. It goes very deep. Let me bring up the fact uh, on that. I got the trash to. Oh, hey, look at that. We have a we have another three. guest. Yeah, he's a wet dog. <laughs> awesome. Um, I I got the trash too. I, I'll say one reason I like it, and in any plugin that's good, what makes it really good or great to me is when they offer you a lot of really good presets. Yeah. And trash two does that. And then my two cents on software. Something I'll recommend that I purchased. Uh, it's been a while now. They they've had good updates. They have a lot of tools built in, and it's really easy to drop them onto tracks when you're producing radio imaging or you want to screw with your voiceover, and it's really easy to just get some cool stuff fast is all the Sound Toys plugins. 
Yeah. I have the Sound Toys yeah, bundle. Great, the, yeah. Um, I'll recommend that one, at least for my two cents on this, as tons of presets, tons of presets, and you can get cool sounds, you know, messed up sounds and delays and reverbs going very immediately in your production. Yeah, I don't have the Sound Toys stuff, but everybody I know that uses it, it tells me. You I, I have it. a lot of Sound Toys stuff. It. The only problem that I have with Sound Toys is it's great for uh, After Effects and, you know, basically for effects if you want to really do some treatments. But, I mean, if you're just trying to do bare bones basic uh, utility work, that's Sound Toys kind of, uh, you can't really use it to do surgical work on a voice track if you're trying to notch out an EQ or something. But you'd say Nectar can do that. That, that, yes. that fills that role, yeah. Yeah, Nectar was the one when uh, I was telling you I had like you know my Sennheiser 416 versus my U99. Nectar easily. Oh, got that's it. how you did it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And that, that was the I old. I want to bring up. Check that one out. I want to bring up another submitted question here, and I'm not actually positive. I'm not positive what he means, but I, he wants to know about doing client sessions um, using Skype or other means, and and this has actually come up a bunch recently. With uh, Sound Streak has come out. You have Source Connect, and then ISDN, but Skype. Um, do you guys have any ways that you love to do client sessions that aren't expensive, potentially maybe are actually free, where the client can get a, a good quality view and 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 listen on what you're doing? Yet, again, like I said, it's it's free, or or maybe you're recording local. But anyway, do you have any uh, suggestions on that? If you want free, there's nothing better than Skype. Yeah. Um, uh, let me ask a second question on that then with what he brought up. Now, I've used Soundflower to wire up the sound card on my Mac a, a few different ways. Is there a way to use Soundflower involved with Skype? Again, I don't know what he means for sure on this question, but have you uh, ever done anything with Soundflower sound, on Skype? Soundflower will be kind of like almost like Bluetooth or something. It's going to send the audio somewhere else, and it's going to introduce latency. Um, so I would avoid that. Bluetooth will introduce latency too. So if you're using a Bluetooth mic, or I was trying to do these Bluetooth headphones so I could hear you guys and have the mic be separated, but it didn't work. Um, I, I'm not a fan of Soundflower, mostly because it's, it has a tendency to take over my Mac, and so I'm using it when I don't realize I'm using it, and then when I don't hear something or you guys don't, couldn't hear me, um, I had to go and get it out of that. Yeah, that's happened to me too. Yeah, there's I wish, something. Uh, I wish more people use Source Connect. You know, I remember when we were first getting Mel set up, we, we, we invested in Source Connect, and I guess I was kind of naive in thinking that, you know, there would be, you know, plenty of clients to use it, and I don't know if we've ever used it. And it works great, but nobody uses it, and it's a bummer because it's, you know, it's decent quality and um, easy to get going, but nobody... I, have you ever used Source Connect with anyone, Jeff? I have three clients that use Source Connect, and yeah. when you do direct Source Connect sessions, it is really, really nice. Yeah, and the quality nice. is good enough so that they can record what they're getting from you. In other words, you, you, I'm not recording on my end. They just record on their end, yeah. uh, very much like ISDN. It's supposed to be a replacement for ISDN. The problem that I have with Source Connect, and I could chew your ears off about this big issue I had with it yesterday, um, is the latency can be up to 500 milliseconds per side. Uh, which, if you're doing a bridge with ISDN, it's too much. So, yeah. like, I, I, if I'm having a conversation with you, as soon as I'm done talking, I say over, because otherwise we're we're stepping on each other. I've heard that. Yeah. So what I went and bought yesterday, uh, and I did a lot of research on this. There's boxes from Audio TX. There's the uh, um, Telocephor has the Zip One. I bought a Comrex Brick B R I C. Uh, so it's a dedicated box. It costs about 1300 bucks, and you can get cheaper ones, I guess, but I guess you're getting what you pay for. I'm going to stick one here, and I'm going to stick one in my Melrose studio. The latency is anywhere from 5 to 50 milliseconds, but that's less than a cell phone. So now when I get on and I use this as a bridge with my ISDN line here, there'll be no latency. It'll be as if for all practical purposes I'm right in the studio. Um, and so you, this, have to buy, you have to buy two of them. I do, yeah, because I'm making my own bridge. Right. Uh, if everyone had these, we could just talk to each other with these IP boxes that are outboard uh, cool. that have less latency than Source Connect. Source Connect is great, but the latency is so much that it, it's it's becoming an issue. I want less latency, but the same audio quality. Now, are you saying a Source Connect to Source Connect connection, the latency is still too bad, or just if you're trying to bridge with an ISDN? Uh, if you're doing direct Source Connect, it's, it doesn't seem to be bad. Uh, I, I didn't have a problem when it's direct. Yeah, I, haven't I haven't tried bridging it with an ISDN, so I, I didn't know that. I, I can't get ISDN in my Melrose studio, so and I have ISDN. Actually, you know what? I think Nick Daly uh, is doing a similar setup to you. I, I, in hindsight, I do recall him telling me the same thing you said about the the Source Connect latency. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm trying to work around it, and I, I just found out about something new. 
but uh, it's a weird one. Um, it was George Whittem who's who's raving about it, and it's actually the same algorithm that we're using now for this Google Hangout. Uh, it's a codec that's called Opus One. Yeah. And the company that I think it's ITHCP or something. Um, if if I can find the message, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Uh, but that might be a source connect killer because it apparently has much less latency. The quality is just as good, and it's free. Cool. And, and what he nice. was saying was that actually Skype was going to start using that codec, right? And then, then Skype could actually, if they were to start implementing that codec, then Skype could actually be the ones to kill Source Connect. I'm waiting for Skype to do that. Right now, the Skype quality varies so wildly, it's not reliable. Uh, as, yeah, it, yeah know, absolutely. It, yeah. It, it, I'm just Skype waiting for something, me. I'm waiting for something to kill ISDN, period. I, I okay. just wish ISDN could just go away. No one, I, it's such a hassle, it's expensive. Let me uh, let me jump in and uh, yeah, Steve, you're already going about it. So we'll start with you. Um, I wanted to one of the last main topics before I close this out is going to be ISDN here. Where there's so many things. I mean, we could just keep talking forever. But um, is ISDN going to die? Why hasn't it yet? Will it? What you know? Are pe people that might be on the verge of investing in it because they're like, I got this one client that's going to mean you know two grand a month in business. But they're the only ones I'd use ISDN for. You know, should people continue to invest in it? What are your thoughts on it, Steve? Start with you. Well, it's tough. I mean, it's a, it's it's a gamble um, because it is expensive. But put it this way: so when we first set up Melody, um, when she got signed to Atlas, one of the things it says that you have to get ISDN. Um, we got the ISDN. And fortunately, not much longer, she started booking stuff for HGTV um, and Lifetime and a couple of things. So it paid itself back. Um, but over the years, it's just become more expensive. Um, it's become, you know, I think someone like Jeff Berlin, I mean, Jeff, I mean, you're, you're doing, you, are you using ISDN a lot? I mean, is this, is this kind of a part of your regular workflow? I rarely use the ISDN. Like really? That. Okay, well, see... I, gosh, I, would you say it's worth it then from your professional... Uh, no, you yeah. shouldn't get it unless you need it. If you have a client that wants to use it, then get it. Uh, it it's getting more difficult, too. I know here in St. Louis, we, we just went through... I, I've got a really bad taste in my mouth with, with the ISDN situation because we just had a nightmare of a situation dealing with it and getting it moved to our new house. And it turns out that uh, the, out here in St. Louis, they're not even installing new ISDNs anymore. Um, it's just... it's it's. And, and trying to get somebody on the phone to discuss it and get some of our issues worked out was just, it was just a nightmare. And they jacked up the, they like tripled the prices on it. And they can do that. They're trying to just get people off of it, you know. Um, so I'd say for new guys, I don't know, that's up to you. If you think you're going to be able to make the money back, you know, a return on your investment quickly, I mean, go for it. Keep in mind, you also have to spend like, I don't know how much we spent, it's like four grand on the, uh, the Zephyr Extreme box too. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just a lot of money you got to dump into it right off the gate, and I just wish, I think you'd get away with a phone patch, you know, buy a good hybrid, tell us makes a really good hybrid, we got one of those too, I think it's the HD, uh, HDX or something like that, we just got that, it's a really nice hybrid, 700 bucks, I think, um, maybe you can try yeah. starting off with offering your clients a phone patch over the ISCN and kind of see how it goes. And Jeff, so you talk about that because you're you're the one who I would have assumed actually would use the ISDN more. Yeah, you see it very rarely. It's uh, usually big studio networks, in fact, right? I mean, network promo that would would force people to have to have an ISDN. Is that typically true, or who or what is the reason people are still having? You know, why do you still have an ISDN? Why do people still go out and get ISDN and keep this thing alive? I think uh, if, if you're doing promos for CBS Television or ABC, they want to do ISDN. Uh, they want to feed you the audio. They want you to read to it in real time, and then they record on their end, and then they just drop it right in. It's, it saves them time, uh, which is fine. I know uh, A&E Television, who I, I'm on with almost every day, they used to yeah. do exclusively ISDN. Uh, but with me, I, I explained to them, so, well, you can just be on the phone. I'll upload the you know full 48K a uh, 16-bit AIF file to your server, and you'll get better quality. And what they realize is they can direct me while they're at lunch or in their, they're in their car on a cell phone. They don't have to be in a studio with ISDN, and they love that. So now, even if there is ISDN in the studio and I have it here, they still don't want to connect anymore. 
and I'm finding that with almost all of my former ISDN clients, they is like it the convenience. A, is it a union thing? I mean, wh what is it about the networks? I mean, I've asked this to a lot of people. Everybody has an opinion, you know, and, and I don't have anything against it per se. I'm not in that world. But is it a union thing? Like, why do they still need to voice to picture? Are they so much busier than the other networks? I haven't done any of the national, you know, the, the you know ABC, CBS, NBC. I, I don't know. You'd have to like Chad Erickson could tell you because he's doing stuff for CBS now. Corley obviously does that all the time as well. But even Corley tells me he rarely uses his ISDN. He'll do stuff for Fox TV, and they don't necessarily care that it's ISDN anymore. Do Do you think, Jeff, that if uh, a client booked you and they said, oh, I like his voice, um, let's let's book this guy. And then they said, they call you up and said, oh, what's your ISDN? And you said, oh, I don't have ISDN, we'll have to do a phone patch. Do you think they'd say, oh, well, never mind, I'm, I'm moving on to another voice talent? I, I think they would uh, hold me in a lower regard as a voice talent, that I'm not really a player if I don't have it. Um, you know, I mean, so I would never tell them that I don't have ISDN. So I'd have them call here. That's interesting. And, I would just patch and not even tell them. I haven't them. heard anyone actually say that, but I mean that that is kind of a status thing then. I mean being an ISDN talent is kind of a status thing and if they were to hear you weren't an ISDN talent, they'd be thinking, oh, well who the heck did we just hire? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if a client wants to do ISDN, I will bend over backwards to make sure they get it the way they want it. Uh, if they're indifferent, if they're not sure, if it's a hassle for them, they're not used to ISDN either, then I'll give them their options. The best one being just, you know, be on Skype or be on the phone, direct me, you'll hear me in real time, but then download your tracks afterwards at full fidelity. Because the reality is ISDN is what? Like, you know, it's the, the equivalent of 128 kilobit per second MP3, isn't yeah. it? It's yeah, not it's great. Like yeah. MP3, yeah. Um, let, me, let me come to the end here, guys. We were coming up on an hour. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And You'll, you'll both agree, I know, we could sit here and yap about tech for a long time. I hope, it was, I hope it was of value to people. We've had a lot of viewers here, um, and then we'll put it up on YouTube and people will watch later. Anyway, the final thing I wanted to bring up, I guess I will start, but if, we're, if it's going to come down to everything we've talked about and maybe something you haven't actually mentioned, but the, you know, one tool, one thing, technologically speaking, that you can do right now to better your life in this media world that we work in, you know, what would that be? I will say mine um, would be something we actually haven't brought up yet, but SSD hard drives. I decided, as I thought about this yesterday, uh, we all three of us have brought this up. All three of us are firmly implanted in the SSD world, but solid state hard drives. If you're working on, um, you know, a MacBook Pro and you do your work in that, or you're working on a big, humongous um, Mac Pro tower, you know, with lots more power, you know, one fast, easy, and, and really these days pretty inexpensive way to increase your speed immensely is to switch over to solid-state hard drives. Yeah. So that's what I will say, especially uh, the drive on which your OS resides. Your your computer boot time could be 20, 30, 40, a minute two minutes right now, it'll go to like five seconds. And yep. then opening up Pro Tools. I remember uh, at one point, at, at worst, my Pro Tools would take up to two minutes to load. And this is on a PC. I swapped to an SSD. This is the first one I swapped to. It loaded in something like seven or ten seconds. And I couldn't believe it. Um, anyway, I've switched to SSD drives on everything. The prices are coming down. They're a great, great way to increase your speed. And that's mine. So, Jeff, let's go to you. Uh, well, I'll share your sentiment on SSD. I've gone all SSD on both my MacBook Pro, which I've gotten another year of use out of, and my Mac Pro, where I've got two SSD drives in there now. Love, like huge. Much more of a fantastic difference than getting a faster processor or anything else. Yeah. Uh, my thing is um, to speed up your workflow, uh, I'm really into controllers. I like having flying faders on everything, on Pro Tools, and I use a Metric Halo, LIOA, so I'm running a... a virtual mixer there on the computer. I don't like using the mouse. I want a fader. I want to be able to turn things up and down and solo and mute using my hands. Yeah, I'll just show you. I have an old, uh, I have an old uh, Huey. How do you say it, Steve? Mac Huey. <laughs> I, uh, anyway, sorry. I, I completely agree is all I was going to say, Jeff. I've got one and I like having faders. So having faders and, and quick keys is a software that I use to do macros. Uh, so I have a lot of repetitive tasks. If I'm recording station after station, every time I record, I have to rename the file, uh, convert the file, upload it to an FTP site, a specific folder, and then compose an email to let them know. And I use macros to automate all that so it takes seconds instead of several minutes. When I found I was spending just as much time 
after I recorded the voice track, just getting it processed and uploaded as I was recording. So I, I was able to like greatly speed up the amount of time, and therefore I can get more work done in, in the same amount of time, thanks to macros. Uh, in my case, it's quick keys. I know there's others like it out there. There's iKeys, and I'm sure there's macros for PCs, too. Um, so to me, that's the biggest uh, time-saving productivity boost you can, you can engage, is to really start using macros to speed up your workflow. Let me ask you real quick a follow-up on that, on like quick keys or, or are you setting up a macro. I know you're on a Mac. How easy would you say, what, what's the learning curve on that to get those going for something a little bit complex, like you said, uh, naming and sending emails when you're done with a file? It's really as difficult as it is to simply analyze what your keystrokes are and your mouse movements to do the same tasks over and over. Uh, and then applying them into a program where you write them down. You tell it to do this, then do this, then do this. It's, it's actually kind of fun to set up because then some, it misses something, and then you go and see what it is. So it does take time to set up. I think the uh, the benefit, the, the payoff afterwards is well worth it, though. Okay. Steve, what about you? Man, you guys stole all the good ones. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> solid-state drives, man, that's, it's been a, a game changer for me. Uh, lots of RAM, too. I mean, basically anything you can do to add new life to your machine is just a given. Um, for me, and it's funny because I remember I, when I first talked to you, Ryan, I think I said I didn't really use templates. I don't know. It might have been you that, that I said that to. Uh, maybe somebody else, but I am a template guy now. Um, I've just become so busy that if, um, if I have to get something produced quickly uh, without a template to have to go and set up my EQ chains and all that stuff, it, it, just, it, would take, it would just take up way too much time. So now, in Logic, I've got different templates built for different scenarios. I save all of my channel strip settings. Now, obviously, one size doesn't fit all. You know, you have to kind of tweak and adjust depending on the application. But um, set up smart templates um, that you can easily tweak and change. And, and it might not just be um, it might not just be plugin chains and tracks, but also some kind of raw sounds that you have layered into your session. For me, I, I build all my sound design myself, so I have a lot of these raw sounds kind of in my bin or layered on tracks ready to go so that I can kind of mix and match. Let's take this, this, this hit and layer it with this one and create a new thing. You know, I've got all of that stuff ready to go, whether it's for uh, uh, trailer music or radio promo or uh, a jingle. It doesn't matter. I've got, a, I've got a, a template for every single scenario, and that's been the biggest workflow um, increaser that uh, that I've experienced um, more so than any of the other stuff, more so than the, the RAM and the hard drives and all that stuff. Templates all the way. That's great. Well, well, guys, uh, we just crossed over the hour mark. I think I don't have a clock actually, but I think we did. Um, it, Jeff Berlin. Uh, voiceover talent extraordinaire. Uh, I actually, I highly respect your work, man. You sound great. If people want to hear you, uh, jberlin.com is that the best place to just go there? Yeah, that's my old site. I should update it someday. Oh, can you hear me? Uh oh, did I lose you? Oh, am I here? Hello. I hear you. Uh oh. Yeah, we got glitchy connections. Yes, jberlin.com. Yeah, I think we're we're losing. There you are. All right, well, jberlin.com or jeffberlin.com. Excellent. Uh, Steve, you do a lot of different things. Um, excellent, excellent. jeffberlin.com. Uh, Steve, where should people find you and see what you do, hear what you do? Um, I, I guess you could just go to I, – I don't really have much online right now. Um, you can go to about.me slash Steve Sykes. <laughs> I'm terrible at that stuff. I don't, I don't put anything online. Um, but, yeah, about.me slash Steve Sykes, I guess, if you want to – get in touch or hear a couple things on SoundCloud. Yeah, Lucia? Everybody's if people have questions for you guys, can they reach out to you? And obviously I'm asking I'm asking this live, so you have to say yes, but what's the best way for people to actually contact you? Do you like Facebook messages? Do you like tweets? Do you like uh, LinkedIn uh, requests? Whatever. What do you like? Can you everybody hear me? Uh, Facebook works for me. If you go to my website, there's an email address. You can email me. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share my knowledge with anyone who's willing, who wants to learn. Email for me. Uh, my email All right. Is up Steve, on, what about you? Yeah, email. Uh, it's up on that link that I gave you. Uh, you can email me directly from there. I mean, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I mean, actually, Twitter might be quickest. Uh, at GoSteveGo is my Twitter uh, name. So, I mean, you can just find me on there. I'm usually tweeting, like, you know, 
work, you know, work related All stuff. Right, there we go. Lines and stuff in me in the studio. Uh, actually, blah, blah, blah. you know what? I'll say this. I'll, yeah, okay, you just said it. Uh, so if anyone's on Vine, I Vine, I think, maybe three times in my life, and I, you know, once every three months. But, Steve, you put a lot of cool Vines where you, you mid-work, you're doing some cool synth, you're making some piece of music, you're doing something, and you'll just yeah. throw the phone right up on your screen and do a Vine about it. Those are fun. Yeah, yeah, Vine. You know, I've actually met, not to extend this conversation any longer, but I've actually hooked up and networked with uh, other artists and, 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 you know, producers and things. I met through Vine. Um, just they heard my music and behind the scenes stuff I do on there, and it's it's kind of crazy. But yeah, actually Vine. I forgot about Vine. Find me on Vine. I do a lot of behind the scenes studio stuff as I'm composing or building sound sound design. I, I like to Vine it a lot. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I'm at Go Steve Go on that. That's well, linked to your Twitter, right? Vine is linked to your Twitter. So yeah, or just search. Yes, it. yes correct. Okay. I'll have to check out Vine. Wow. Right. And Vine is the one with just short, short yeah. videos only. Short videos, but yeah. Hey, man, you could do yeah. like some six-second VO Vines behind the scenes. Jeff Berlin in the outhouse studio rocking it. <laughs> Actually, for for real, I think, Jeff, you could get a, you could get some good stuff going on Vine. You know, yeah, you're you doing could. a session with A&E, you know, real fast out there in the outhouse studio, as Steve said, just boom, you know, tonight at 10, a bunch of drug addicts hate each other. There you, you know, go. Yeah. So um, there you go. All right, that. man. Well, guys, uh, I think on that note, we'll, we'll go ahead and end it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, until next time, I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you. Very much enjoy.